Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. April 18, 1906 at 513 AM local time in San Francisco. One of the most significant earthquakes and subsequent fires ravaged the San Andreas fault line. More than 3,000 people died and more than 28,000 buildings were just destroyed. In the same year, something would be the beginning of the devastation of defenses across professional football forevermore. This week's hero helped build the precursors to one of the original NFL teams, and near the beginning of his career, it all started around the forward pass. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is October 25th, 1906, and we're here to watch a game between the Massillon Tigers and a team that will be combined of Bentwood and Moundsville, West Virginia. But why are we here? I mean, it doesn't make any sense because we don't talk about this that much. We talked about the game last week, right? Can Bulldogs, Massillon Tigers, who a month later would play in a 1906 game at a scandal rocking the professional football world? But that's not why we're here a month previously, October 25th, 1906. The reason why we're here is because the hero of this story, George Peggy Parrott of the Massillon Tigers, became the first man to ever complete a legal forward pass in a game in professional football. Yes, October 25th, 1906, the first time in a professional football game, there was a forward pass. Nowadays, we're like, yeah, sure, the quarterback throws it like 30, 40, 50 times. Like, well, it's just part of the game. We're even lucky if we have a 50% rushing attack sometimes. But not then. That was just, like, ludicrous. And this pass would go to Dan Bullet Riley. I mean, if you're going to throw the ball, why not throw it to a guy named Bullet, right? (laughs) Run down the field, Bullet. I'll see if I can catch up to you with this football. Now, the football was not the same as it is nowadays. It was not meant to be tossed around about the air. Nowadays, it's set up so we can get those hands around it, get the mitts on it, and throw it down the field, get the touchdown, get all the scores, the points flying on the board. But in 1906, let's just say that was not the case. It wasn't revolutionary at the time, but the forward pass, it wasn't normal either. I mean, professional football did follow the 1906 collegiate rule book, and there was a pass in college ranks before the professional football game on October 25th, 1906, not yet the NFL, nor was it the American Professional Football Association. However, this still was very important because the first time the professional ranks decided, well, let's go ahead and throw this ball forward and see what happens. I mean, back then, guys like Breeze and Brady, I don't think they'd make it too long. I mean, let's just think about this. The ball, you could throw it, but you're going to get smashed. And they had two odd rules that were just different. Nowadays, of course, have been changed. But back then, for some reason, this was what they had. The first rule was the passer had to be five yards or more behind the line of scrimmage. I mean, sure, not bad for Breeze or Brady. We'll just go ahead, throw it at shotgun. But here's the kicker. If you throw the ball and you're not five yards or more behind the line of scrimmage, then the ball would be forfeited to the defense. So think about that. You're dropping back, shotgun, going to look it over there. Got to, hey, Drew Brees, I got Michael Thomas. But I'm only four yards behind the line of scrimmage. I throw it. Michael Thomas completes it for a touchdown. But the ref says, nope, sorry, you're not more than five yards behind the line of scrimmage. The defense gets the ball. (laughs) 
That just what? What are you talking about? That obviously would be changed a little bit later, but the second rule was even more crazy. Now check on this. If you drop back, you pass the ball, and it was an incomplete pass, and neither the offensive player nor the defensive player even touched it, then again, it's changed over to the defensive side of the ball. So you got a guy like, let's just say Lamar Jackson, you know, tossing it out there, even nowadays, oh man, this dude from Washington Redskins, oh boy, that guy, that Haskins dude, he drops back, he tries to throw it to Terry McLaurin for a deep bomb, and he overshoots him. Well, Terry McLaurin couldn't catch the ball, neither could the defense, because he just shot it all the way down the field. Well, that's going to the defensive side of the ball. So, let's just say, passing didn't get utilized nearly like it does today. Things had to change and evolve, and one of the times and events that caused it to change would be this 1932 championship game we've talked about previously. Well, I mean, not officially a championship game. It wasn't called that because it was an ad hoc game, a makeshift sort of playoff game when the Chicago Bears and the Portsmouth Spartans were tied and they're like, oh, gee, well, let's get some more money. Let's go ahead and play another game. But in this game, there was a controversial pass where Bronco Nagurski was running with the ball towards the line, stopped, stepped back, tossed it to Red Grange. Now, here's the problem that the defensive had. And the Portsmouth Spartans, which turned into the Detroit Lions, they're all like, hey, man, that guy's not more than five yards behind the line of scrimmage. That should be turned over to us. So, nonetheless, things ultimately would get changed. And we would now turn into, of course, what we are, a passing league. However, we're talking many years later. If you want to, I covered this game in more detail way back in episode 46 of the podcast. To make it easier on you, I'll go ahead and leave a link in the show notes for you. And by the way, you can get to the show notes for your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com. Again, that's thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, while you're at it, man, I ask that you please subscribe for free to this show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. 1932, championship game. They realized we're onto something here. We have a few things we can change. So after that, the NFL is deciding, hey, man, we're going to adopt our own rule book that following season. Part of it, we're going to improve some of the passing rules. But going back to Peggy Parrott, why is he the hero of this particular story? I mean, sure, 1906, October 25th, he tossed that ball out of the field to Bullet Riley for the first ever forward pass. That's not the only thing that he gave to what would ultimately become the NFL. So I'm going to tap on this flux capacitor right here. Ding, 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 ding. We're going to flip the script and we're going to backtrack over to 1905. This time we were at Case University in Cleveland, Ohio. And this would be a story of a man named Jimmy Murphy. Wait a second. Jimmy Murphy. Thought you said we we're going to talk about Peggy Parrott. Exactly. You see this Peggy guy. He was using an alias of Jimmy Murphy to play professional football for the Shelby Athletic Club, even though he was still playing for Case University. And it had to be this Cleveland newspaper. He's all like, hey, there was this guy. He's a college player, but he was playing professionally for the Shelby Athletic Club. So he got called out, and I'm sure he was full aware of the uh, repercussions. He was an honest man. He admitted to it. He didn't even say, nope, I didn't do it. I didn't try to hide it or anything like many of the other players did. It's not like he was the first one that was moonlighting as a professional player, as a college athlete. Ultimately, he was barred from Case University Athletics forevermore. The article from Milt Roberts from the Pro Football Researchers Association had this to say about it. Pirate thus became the first well-known college football star to be disciplined by his school for playing professional football on the side. Other named players had done the same thing, but when questioned about it, had winked and denied charges. To Peggy's credit, he did not lie. Robert's article stated that this was a huge blow to Case University Athletics, because he was also the star for the basketball team and the baseball team. He said that later on, he was even good enough to play professional sports for both of those two sports later on. A all-around gifted athlete. But this brings us full circle to what we're talking about at the beginning of the episode. 1906. This is when he was signed by the Massillon Tigers. 
And the Milt Roberts article also stated it was because of his knowledge of this new fancy dancy offensive weapon. Something called, well, a forward pass. Nowadays, we often see teams passing to set up the run. Back then, however, not the case. Of course, like I said, <laughs> you could throw the ball. It could be incomplete. You might not even hit anybody. Then all of a sudden, bam, boom, now we got the defense getting the ball, heading down, shoving it down your throats. So not quite used the same as it is today. But nonetheless, he would start at quarterback for the Massillon Tigers. And then on October 25th of 1906, he made professional football history with that first legal forward pass in professional football. Then the Massillon Canton scandal of 1906 from the Canton episode would rock the professional football world. Peggy bounced around for a few years. Uh, I saw Franklin Athletic Club in Cleveland, and then he went back to the Shelby Blues, where he made his pro debut back in 1905. And then the Shelby Blues decided where they were a pretty good team all the way throughout 1908. Then in 1909, he was the head coach at Shelby. But at the same time, I guess he was coaching at his alma mater, Case University. I'm like, wait a second, what happened there? I thought you got kicked and banned off the university back in 1905 for playing for those very Shelby Blues. But whatever, that's how it goes. So Peggy stayed on with Shelby until 1912 season, when this whole story kind of starts kicking up a little bit. He played with this team, Shelby, until the 1912 season. Later on, he would move his talents over to Akron. But during his time with the Shelby Blues, there was one particular game that stuck out. It was a game in 1911 between Canton and Shelby. There was what the article called a heated dispute over an offside call during the title game. Canton was upset and they forfeited. They're like, I'm out of here, man. Just deal with it. Uh, I, I give up. The Roberts article mentioned that Parrott was willing to compromise. But at the time, Canton Captain Harry Turner was all like, no way, dude, I'm out of here. So on November 26th of 1911, Canton Turner vowed to quit football. And apparently Turner told this to the Canton repository. Right or wrong, no more football for me after this. These old football duds, mud and dirt, go to the attic to rot. I'm done. But I, I don't understand why he says, you know, why don't you go to the attic and Rot and all that kind of thing and stuff like this. Quit being a crybaby, man. This is football. However, remember this for a little bit later. That would be an important piece of information. Regardless, 1912. Peggy takes over the Akron Indians. Like I said, he moved his talent to Akron. And now he's a player, coach, team owner, manager, everything, whatever have you. So he changed what the article said, the name to Parrots Indians instead of the Akron Indians, because he wanted to let you know this is Peggy Parrots' team. Something else happened that year. Apparently there was a team that came out of nowhere. The Alaria became a powerhouse. Many of his Shelby players were there. So it's kind of an important note here because Parrot encouraged the players moving around the leagues to make that more teams kind of, you know, uh, competition. He encouraged competition in the league, which is important because he understood at the very beginning that if you had just a few dominant teams winning it every year, then leagues would fizzle out. It wouldn't be a league, just be a bunch of random teams trying to play against each other at the bottom. Then up on top, you got a few teams that are just fighting for the championship. Unfortunately, that's what it's like right now. It seems like we just talked about last week with uh, Pod Vader, the dang stinking Patriots Invitational. But they're going to be knocked off their throne pretty soon. Parrot kept recruiting. He gained some bigger names. 1914, this is when he landed a pretty big name in his own right. The name Newt Rockney. This was the legendary coach. Later on, he was the coach for the vaunted four horsemen, you know, pestilence and all the kinds of guys coming from the sky. and They're going to just dominate you and they're going to run over you because they're just four dudes running the ball. On November 15th, 1914, remember that guy, Harry Turner, he said, I ain't never playing football no more. Well, there's a game, November 15th, 1914. Tragedy would just strike its evil, rear its head again. He did play in this game. He suffered a broken spine tackling Akron's fullback. He would die shortly after the game. 
And this was what the article said, the first fatal accident involving major professional football team in Ohio. This was also the time, the first time that this new Canton team had beaten Peggy's Akron Indians. So from the article, here's a quote from Turner on his deathbed. It said, According to Jack Cusack, Turner on his deathbed whispered, I know I must go, but I'm satisfied, for we beat Peggy Parrott. So, I mean, it's a sad moment. No doubt. It's just something that fortunately happened much more frequently back in the early days of professional football or football in general. But it showed what people thought of Peggy Parrott and what he meant to the league. Also, that same year, Akron would come back and they'd beat Canton 21 to nothing on Thanksgiving Day. Because Peggy Parrott's Indians were back, baby. And they took the 1914 crown. Then we'll shift forward, get some things going on. 1916, Peggy moves over to Cleveland. And he'd start a different team called the Cleveland Indians. And then he himself would play his last game, according to the article that is, on October 22nd of 1916. But he was always linked to trying to help build this professional football league. And in 1920... Sure enough, it happened. And according to Jack Cusack's book, Canton never let anyone cross their goal in 1916, except for Peggy Perry's Cleveland Indians. The way that they did it was a blocked punt behind the Canton goal line. Now, if nothing less, you know, it's like, hey, there you go. We were able to be the only ones that scored on Canton that year. Unfortunately, of course, we talk about this quite often. The World War I years, just like in World War II, difficult for all teams. So let's shift forward to 1919. A local sports promoter, Jimmy O'Donnell, he purchased this team. He's all like, hey man, let's just switch this team over. We're going to call them the Cleveland Tigers. And in 1920, he would join with the Cleveland Tigers, this newly formed American Professional Football Association, later named, of course, the NFL. He had a star on his team, a former star from Notre Dame and the Massillon Tigers named Stanley Kofall. And according to the Case Western Preserve University, Stan Kofall and Jimmy O'Donnell both attended that September 17, 1920 meeting to gather to represent the Cleveland Tigers. It didn't go too well in the season for them. They'd end up with a 2-4-2 and two record, but something to hang their hats on. Again, they were the only team to score points on somebody the champion. The Akron Pros were the first league champions of the American Professional Football Association in the NFL. But once again, they were the only ones to score points against them all year. They scored seven points. So 1921 comes around. The team switches the name back to the Cleveland Indians. This time, though, we have Jim Thorpe and Joe Guyon. These are two future Hall of Famers. Probably one reason why they switched the name to the Cleveland Indians, because they're both that descent. Same name as baseball team, so that could be also the reason. You know, they had the Cleveland Indians back then, and they shared the stadium. That year, they ended with a 3-5 and five record. Jim Thorpe got hurt pretty early in the year, so I'm wondering if he didn't get hurt, if that record would have been flipped around a little bit. So in 1922, O'Donnell, eh, things are struggling. He received the league permission to what they call suspend operations. However, he was supposed to pay this, you know, $1,000 annual guarantee to keep the franchise going. Kind of like a holdover, I guess. Franchise, he didn't pay it, was canceled. 1923 comes around. Samuel Deutsch buys the team. They have a 3-1-3 and record, so that's not too bad. It's an improvement. But here's where it kind of gets weird, because the 1923 Canton Bulldogs won the 23 championship. Then, we have this thing where the Bulldogs were losing money even though they were champions. So Deutsch buys the team for 1500 bucks, and then he switches the best players from Canton to Cleveland, and now we have the Cleveland Bulldogs instead of the Canton Bulldogs and Cleveland Bulldogs. So now the Canton Bulldogs also won the championship back in 1922 and 23. So they were the first back-to-back champions. So 1924, we have the Cleveland Bulldogs. We don't have Canton Bulldogs. It's that combined team. The Cleveland Bulldogs in 1924 win the championship. So most of this was probably because of the star Canton Bulldog players. So it's kind of like a three-peat. So even though the Canton Bulldogs were the first team to go back-to-back champions, 1922 and 1923, It's almost like they went back to back to back. However, they were called the Cleveland Bulldogs at the time. But in 1925, the Canton Bulldogs and the Cleveland Bulldogs were both in the league again. 
I mean, the NFL standing shows they both have separate teams. Peggy Parrott apparently shows back up because he was introduced at the league meeting on August 1st of that year, 1925, to represent the Cleveland team and also to represent Dorch. So it's like Peggy Parrott just keeps coming back. The Cleveland Bulldogs would just go away and perish in 1926. And on February 6th of 1926, Peggy was recognized by the NFL because he was named to two of the league's three most important committees. The first one, he was tasked with helping to redraft the NFL Constitution and bylaws. I mean, that's pretty important. He was also put on a three-man committee to meet with the Intercollegiate Committee of Athletics in New York City. New York City? This was with George Hallis and Dr. Harry March. So not too bad. He got put on the same committee as legendary George Hallis. So in 1927, though, the team, you know, we got this team in the league for an 8-4-1 record. 1928, sold and moved to Detroit. They were called the Detroit Wolverines, which is kind of interesting because the team had a 7-2-1 record that year. Only lasted one year, though. Which brings us to the side interesting golden gridiron knowledge nugget. With a 77.8% win record, this would be the best all time in the NFL. Now, even though the Decatur Staley's and Chicago Staley's were technically both in the 90s, they turned in to the Chicago Bears. So that doesn't really count a whole lot. And the reason why it's the highest percentage is because the team was sold to Tim Mara of the New York Giants. And he basically, he's like, I'm shutting the team down. I just wanted a few players and such and all these kinds of things. But still, with all this being said, I think that we have to give Peggy Parrott at least a little bit of recognition for the early fights for professional football back in, you know, the early 1900s. And he may not have been involved directly with the NFL officially when it was first put together the first few years. But he did a lot for professional football to keep it going before the APFA was actually formed. And then he was recognized for it later on being tabbed for some pretty important committees. Nowadays, the Cleveland Browns have been mostly in a defunct state. But there was a time when Cleveland was the team to beat for many years. And some of the greatest players in league history were Browns fighting their way through that dog pound. And even though the dog pound are some of the more loyal fans in the NFL... Maybe to a fault. It all started way back before the NFL was even born. And the first ever franchise in Cleveland was not a dog. It was a cat. And the team name was the Cleveland Tigers. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude podcast and were able to gain some gridiron knowledge nuggets about one of the original heroes of professional football before the NFL was even created. If you enjoyed this episode, I ask that you share it with another football geek such as yourself. You can send them to thefootballhistorydude.com. But next week, let's go ahead and stick with this Tiger theme. We're going to go back again to another original NFL team. This time, we're going to talk about the Chicago Tigers. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe on your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.